morning. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our Off the Record today. We've got a great topic today. We've got uh, the leadership team of ATDC along with one of their member companies here. And we've got a lot to cover. Um, first of all, uh, I know that a lot of folks in our audience are part of the corporate innovation community. So we want to talk about how the corporate innovation community has gotten involved with ATDC and what opportunities exist for corporate innovators to plug into the ATDC ecosystem and the startup ecosystem in general in Atlanta. Uh, we also want to talk about the impact, obviously, that current events have had on ATDC. And, and by current events, I'm talking both about COVID and how that has affected ATDC as well as ATDC membership companies, as well as the push for diversity uh, and everything happening in our city around that and how uh, ATDC is uh, responding to that and, and uh, helping to push the greater need for diversity within the startup ecosystem in Atlanta. So we're going to get to all of those topics during today's uh, discussion. We're also going to welcome your questions in the chat. So as, as we go today, feel free to use the chat. That is part of our uh, part of the Zoom program here. There's a chat button at the bottom and you can ask questions in the chat and we'll intermix those as well. Uh, but I wanted to start off today by, first of all, introducing our panelists, or at least uh, giving them an opportunity to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with the leader of ATDC, John Avery. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, my name is John Avery, uh, currently the director for ATDC. Um, I started this position about a year and a half ago, and formerly was the director for the Panasonic Innovation Center in Midtown for the last five years. So I have a lot of uh, uh, respect for the members of your audience here. That's a tough gig doing the, the corporate innovation work. Um, but really have enjoyed the time here at ATDC and I can tell you more about how we operate in, in a second. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, John. And uh, Corbett, Corbett, I know you get the opportunity to do, to do a lot of the corporate liaison, liaison work for ATDC. Tell us a little more about your role. Yeah, I am manager of the corporate development arm of ATDC. We call it the Industry Connect program. And uh, so basically I work with enterprises, bringing them into ATDC through my own efforts and even through uh, relationships with Georgia Tech. And we go through a bunch of different stages, which I'll, I'll get into later in this conversation, on how to develop relationships with our ATDC companies and how to launch pilots and uh, a bunch of exciting things. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Wonderful, we are looking forward to it as well. Uh, Nakia, um, I know you do a lot of mentorship and education through each ATDC. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Nakia. Nice to meet you this morning. Yeah, so I am um, a startup catalyst at uh, ATDC, um, and some of my roles include managing the mentor program. So a lot of the startups will interface with me to make connections to our wonderful, amazing mentor pool that we have. Uh, but also engage in the Educate program where all of our curriculum um, sits inside for ATDC, where a lot of entrepreneurs will uh, interface uh, through the Educate program and a lot of our services, but we'll get more into that later. And last but not least, we are joined by the founder of one of ATDC's member companies, Paul. Paul, tell us about yourself. Hi, nice to meet everyone. Um, Paul Noble, founder and CEO of Verison. Uh, we're a supply chain intelligence company based at the ATDC, and we are a signature member of uh, the ecosystem there. Ha happy to be joining all of you today. Wonderful. Thank you guys for joining. And, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Jeff Wilson. I'm the founder of 352. And I am particularly personally interested in the conversation because at 352, we work with a lot of growth stage companies. Um, so as a result of that, we're, we're fairly integrated into the local startup ecosystem. Uh, we tend to work with companies uh, that are that maybe recently got a capital injection and are in need of growth, and we can help them across the board with different strategies for that, uh, or companies who are looking to build new ventures and then launch those new ventures into the marketplace and grow. And so we work with both. We work with growth stage companies of all type, from smaller companies uh, that might be coming out of startup incubators all the way on up to large enterprises. All right, let's get started with our conversation today. So. John, for the audience who maybe isn't super familiar with ATDC, can you give us a little bit of background on ATDC? Sure. We are um, essentially the state of Georgia's uh, technology incubator. We're housed and operated out of Georgia Tech. Uh, we've been around since 1980. 
Uh, our goal, our top line mission is to grow the Georgia economy through entrepreneurship. So our mission is to create successful companies in Georgia that hire lots of employees, hopefully some of those being engineers. <laughs> um, we have a combination of services that we offer. We have a, um, a bunch of uh, curriculum for people that are trying to find out about how to do a startup. Uh, our entry level for most people is called the Educate Program. It's $25 a quarter. Uh, anybody in the state of Georgia can uh, sign up and come and take those classes. They're all virtual now because of uh, the last few months, everything has moved virtual. So it's a lot easier to participate. And these classes have a lot to do with how you get started as a founder. Um, so customer discovery, financial literacy, investor readiness, things that are kind of core to being a good founder for a company. Um, our goal there is to help people determine if this is something that they really want to do. Uh, in most cases, it's not. <laughs> Uh, we we uh, talk about it being in some way we want to make sure that somebody's taking a, a good honest look at what it means to be an entrepreneur before they take the leap and leave the day job and go after this idea full time. So um, we have a collection of uh, well, there's actually three tiers in the program. So educate is the typical entry point for those people that are just investigating the idea. Many of them uh, we do try to target companies, but in general, we don't verify that the people that come into the program are all companies. In many cases, they're just individuals wanting to learn how to do a startup. And that educational curriculum is valuable for just about any kind of company. Um, but our portfolio, once a founder has decided they wanna go full time into an idea, they're all in, they validated that this market exists and that they have a product that could possibly uh, suit the market. We have a portfolio level called Accelerate. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale, we have about 525 people in the Educate Level program today. And then we have 120 companies in the Accelerate program today. And uh, the Accelerate program is for at least one, hopefully two founders all in on an idea. They're, it's not a side gig anymore. Uh, they've done some customer validation and they're proving that this uh, idea has some merit. Um, and we're bringing on an assigned coach to help work through that, uh, that idea with the company. Uh, once a company gets to about five to six people, they've got product in market, they've got a, a certain amount of money raised, uh, and they're in the scale mode, we have a top tier called Signature. And uh, that's, we currently have, uh, I think, 36 members at that level. And uh, that's a program for scaling. And um, at that point, they're trying to go from maybe six-ish people to 25 or 30. Um, and then when they reach about a million or so in annual recurring revenue, that would be a sort of a target to consider graduation. Uh, startups can be in our portfolio for uh, about up to three years in our in our uh, Accelerate program, another three years in our Signature program. Typically, it's about five years overall. Um, uh, we have four kinds of coaches that we uh, apply to help the startups be successful. Uh, when you come into the Educate program, the primary interface is our mentor program. Nakia, as you just mentioned, uh, runs that program for us. We have a list of about 100 names on there. Most of them are industry experts, really amazing uh, people that have deep knowledge in specific industries. Many of them are startup savvy as well. About 30 or 40 or so are pretty active and they uh, attend the classes and help give coaching on that basis and the rest are reachable through our network for connections. And um, they help in the early stages of the company to get founded and understand the direction that they're going. When they come into the Accelerate level, we have a, a group of paid uh, business coaches, they're called Startup Catalysts. That's something rare and it's hard to find in a lot of incubators and accelerators around that we actually have paid staff that are mostly startup uh, people um, who are assigned to be a full-time, not well, they're a full-time employee, but they're working with a startup as a business coach. Um, those are Startup Catalysts and uh, we have specific industry experts, uh, one in, in retail tech, one in financial tech, and one in health tech. And then we have some horizontal ones that are good at, at marketing and um, other categories that are important for startups. And then when you go into the signature program, we have a, there's a third kind of coach we have is an EIR. It's an entrepreneur in residence. And these are um, very successful startup executives who have been with a startup from the beginning all the way through the growth process and an exit event. And now they're coming back around and spending time with us as a coach uh, to give back. Um, those are half-time employees that are um, coming and doing that coaching for us, usually for about a year or so before they find their next opportunity. And then finally, we have a Connect Catalyst, which is what Corbett is on the call here. Uh, and these are primarily to work across the whole portfolio to connect startups with the resources that they need. So first of all, uh, the industry connect, Corbett's area, is to connect startups 
with Fortune 500 companies that are looking to solve internal problems by engaging with a startup. And the goal there is to create paid pilots, and he can tell you more about that in that, in that section. The other is um, in, uh, Investor Connect. So we've got a full-time person whose job is to know all the different investors who invest in, in Southeast companies, uh, their hypothesis, the size checks they write, what kind of companies you're looking for. Um, and then he knows our portfolio, and he makes the case to match them together when it's the right time. You can imagine most of the startups want to immediately go meet with investors when they come into the program. And uh, so Brad's job is to help them understand what they actually need to do to get ready for that meeting so they can take advantage of it. Um, and then we have a third catalyst called the Campus Connect. And uh, that's Joy Hemmel, and she does a great job connecting the startups, mostly with um, campus resources and primarily relates to hiring. So we have standing reservations at all the career fairs and the different categories. Uh, she can connect them with the resources on campus that can help them grow quickly. And finally, we have an expert in non-dilutive funding. So between the GRAs and uh, SBIRs and STTRs, there's lots of government funding available for technology startups that are hard to navigate. And um, Connie Castillo can help navigate those waters and get those applications, uh, get you directed to where you can write those applications, get those things uh, submitted. And that has a big benefit because it's non-dilutive. So that brings potentially up to millions of dollars into a startup without having to give up any equity. So between those four categories, mentors, startup catalysts, EIRs, and Connect Catalysts, we have a pretty robust group of services that we make available to our startups. Um, we have about 180 graduates over the years since 1980. Uh, about 90% of our um, companies are viable after five years of leaving the program, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, we've uh, estimated about $12 billion generated in revenues from those companies and about $3 billion raised by those companies. So quite an impact. Uh, I think something I heard more than half the VC money that was raised in, uh, in Georgia last year was related to ATDC related companies, either current members or graduates. So um, I guess I'll stop there. We'll uh, uh, move on to the other parts of discussion. Yeah, it's quite, quite an amazing track record. And, and you know, one takeaway that I have from that for sure is that ATDC was doing startups before startups were cool. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, ATDC is definitely the, you know, OG in terms of startups. I mean, you've got, you've got, uh, you know, the new programs in town that have popped up, but they've all popped up in, you know, recent years and ATDC has been there all the way through. And of course, the such, such robustness of the services that ATDC offers. And I'm sure that that's something that took uh, many, many years to build up. And I'm curious, John, uh, one of the one of the things you didn't directly mention was the fact that you have a physical space, obviously, in uh, Tech Square uh, near our office. We're in the Billmore Building, and you guys are right over, uh, just a couple of buildings over. Um, what does that look like, and is that something that that you know the 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 signature companies take advantage of, or how does that piece of it work? We have actually two floor, two or one and a half floors in the Synergy Building, as you mentioned, on Tech Square at Fifth and Spring Street. And um, yes, when you come into the portfolio, the Accelerate and Signature companies have the option to rent space in the building. And we do have a facility that offers uh, a discounted rent when they come into the program that accelerates up every year. So it starts out, I don't know, a little roughly about half of the commercial rate, then it goes up every year after that. So after the third year, it's the full commercial rate. This is kind of a soft running start. We're not a co-working facility, so we don't have like hot desks for, for um, people to come to work. Each company has an office with a door on it. It's their office. It's part of our training in the program to help a CEO understand what it kind of takes to run an office and own the space and sort of set it up and, and create the culture they want to create um, as opposed to like a co-working facility. Um, and so the, the Accelerate suites are very small. They're only for about maybe two people, three people if you're very friendly. <laughs> um, but of course, they have access to the conference rooms and break rooms and other facilities there and all the classes and content and coaches and everything. And the signature suites are between 800 and 1200 square feet or so, and they're, uh, um, they get the window offices as well. So the, the nice thing about the signature suites that people look for is those, uh, the nicer offices with the windows. Um, and uh, it's the same kind of deal there. So uh, like I said, our program is not a six months in and out. People come into our program and can be in the program for several years. And so this, is, this might be the longest term deep connection that a startup founder would have with a with a facility or with a, a network. Uh, most of the accelerators you kind of come and go and we encourage our startups to get involved with accelerators when it's appropriate for their industry uh, but we're here for the long haul. Our goal is to make them su sustainable and successful over the long haul. 
So how has so obviously the physical space is a big is a big part of it. It's certainly not the only part of it because yeah, a lot should, of your programs I extend. We should say that we also have a, a statewide footprint. So our market is any entrepreneur in the state of Georgia, not just in Atlanta. And many of our startups don't have space in our building, which is fine. So they're able to access all of our services without having that space. We do also have people on the ground in Athens and Augusta and Savannah uh, to help coach companies in those areas. And we are able you know, to, to look for additional places to do that where we can. So how has the various, the, obviously the physical space, as well as a lot of the various programs that are, that are tied in or tied around the physical space, how has that been affected the last few months? with COVID and how do you see that playing out as the year goes on? Uh, we're still trying to see what the results of that are gonna be. We do expect there to be some fallout. We have uh, indicated about 10% or so, maybe a little more of the startups who had space in the building previously have gotten used to this working remote idea. And some of them have decided to continue that mode for a while longer. Um, our leases are three months long. So um, there's not a long-term commitment for a startup founder to come into the space and, and operate. Uh, we try to provide that flexibility so they can have uh, they can grow more dynamically but i suspect we'll end up seeing something between 10 and 20 percent of the current tenants uh, moving into a remote operation mode and that's an odd thing for us because we've had a wait list for that space for quite some time this is the first time that i can remember that we actually have potentially some vacancy and that means we might have the opportunity to serve new companies different companies that we didn't know about before or that weren't able to get in before or that have needs that we weren't able to accommodate before. Um, so it's, it's always good to have that chance to do something new that we hadn't previously been able to do. The words, the, the leases are going out this month for the next three months coming up. So we'll find out probably in the next two or three weeks uh, what the real situation looks like there. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, and Nikia, I'm curious from your perspective, as a mentor at ATDC, I imagine one of the things that, that you encourage is, is probably you know, collisions with other startups. And, and, you know, that's, I know that's a big part of ATDC's uh, ecosystem, kind of that serendipity. How has that been affected and how are you advising startups in this environment to be able to keep those collisions going in a world where everyone's, everyone's isolated? Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, we're in a virtual world. I think everyone, you know, surprisingly is adapting. I think it was a gradual process. I think there's some things that, you know, that they miss, like John mentioned, like the energy of being at ATDC and being in the lobby and, you know, and all the stuff that Aubrey does from our popcorn moments to the ice cream in the lobby to people coming in, just the energy that they miss. And there's, that is one of the most crucial parts of a startup's development as well, that social interaction. Um, and so now that that's been taken away, so now everything is being done via virtually. Um, and so now that everything is done virtually, we have had to kind of curate other moments and other opportunities for um, startups to kind of engage without the you know, physical environment. Um, and some of that has been done via these virtual coffee hours, these virtual meetups between us and the entrepreneur. Um, and the in the company and us as the coach or the mentor or the catalyst having to facilitate some of those moments have been um, very rewarding um, and and we've had a couple of it, uh, situations that where we've actually had a game day so to speak where we've all kind of played like a zoom like game to kind of keep some of that energy um, going between us to kind of take their mind off the fact that okay they're in a COVID situation um, they're really not sure about their finances. They're really not sure about their whole startup um, as a whole. But for me, as my role is, is to make sure that I continue to exhaust anything that I have to help keep them going, keep them sane, keep them focused, keep them guided, that, you know, this is just a temporary moment, um, but yet they shall prevail. Um, and our staff has been nothing but amazing in making sure that our companies have everything that they need, whether that be the emotional support um, or any resources that we maybe have. Awesome, that's good to, good to hear that you guys are doing that for sure. Uh, a question came in through the chat for Paul. So Paul, as a startup founder, you're part of the ATDC ecosystem, but you're, you're here as a member company. Um, mm -hmm. What has the last few months been like for you? How has that been? running a growing startup, uh, you know, in this type of environment? 
Yeah, it's certainly challenging. You know, your uh, great ecosystem at ATDC, um, and then you know, hiring employees. We've onboarded a few employees that haven't been able to come into the environment, and um, you know, there's certain challenges of you know when you're creating a culture of onboarding uh, individuals remotely, um, and then the uncertainty uh, across our customer base. Uh, we've been fortunate because we're in uh, a really heightened awareness space in supply chain. So um, as we as we've navigated that kind of first 60 days of uncertainty, March, April, uh, we've seen it level out a bit, but uh, in our space, uh, but you know, we've been very cognizant in terms of the, some of the things Nakia mentioned, and John of uh, doing extra things to bring people together. Um, sending friendly gifts to our employees, uh, coffee and ob sauce uh, from uh, Aubrey there at ATDC, and just trying to foster uh, that team environment, um, obviously all while running the business and, um, and having to continue to grow. Um, uh, the resources at ATDC have been very helpful, um, and we're excited to get back. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully that can all happen soon. Yeah. Um, Corbett, Corbett, I'm curious to hear, uh, I, I want to dive into the corporate partnership stuff a little bit more in detail, but kind of first, I'm just curious, has that, has that cooled down? Are, 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 things, are things going on hold? Are the enterprises and the corporates, you know, is there less, you know, connection there with the startups right now in this type of environment? You know, it, what's surprising is no. Everything has really the first month uh, in March, I spent a lot of time going back to these uh, co corporations and enterprises, doing deep dives to understand where they are, what it has changed in their environment, and then started doing Industry Connect sessions. So we're averaging roughly anywhere from two to three a week. And these are full-blown sessions that we would do in the office, but we're doing it virtually. And uh, so I see a lot of aggressiveness when it comes to innovation, uh, even more than before, because uh, you know, topics from how to repurpose sales teams to repurpose real estate, uh, just different ideas that we've never talked about with companies like Dow or 3M, or even uh, some of our small to medium sized businesses we work with like Kings Hawaiian, that just have different uh, new ways of thinking about innovation, which has really uh, sped it up. So we're seeing some quick turnarounds from the minute we do our session to them reaching out and doing second and third meetings with our companies. So yeah. That's been a plus. Interesting. And seen a little bit of the same thing too of um, because people aren't traveling and they're remote, uh, it has kind of lent towards getting people together faster uh, to do some collaboration sessions than maybe typical schedules would have yielded. Um, and we've seen kind of a condensed uh, selling process and, um, and onboarding process based on that, um, which has been interesting and we'll see how it continues. Corbett, would you say that the interest of the corporates and the enterprises has shifted in recent months from more kind of new venture or M and A or you know bringing you know bringing new things into the market to utilization of uh, current resources, you know, creative optimization of of current business lines? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a mix. We're we're seeing. Uh, companies that are, are looking at what they exist in infrastructure. Let's was take retail, for example. Uh, done a lot of retail industry connect sessions where they have their existing infrastructure, but then also really spending a lot of time on the innovation side when it comes to e-commerce, supply chain, uh, even when stores open back up, how to tackle that with customer interaction so we've seen a, a hybrid version of, on both sides. Corbett, you might have to talk about in detail a little bit. What is a, a deep dive in an industry connect day look like? How does that actually work? 
Yeah, yeah, I was going to go into that later, but I can, I can do that now. We, we go through, you know, a, a deep dive really is, and I get a lot of laughs when I use the term deep dive, that, that really is what it is. We, I dig into these companies because one of the things I don't want to do is do a, a one and done meeting where an enterprise may come and say, you know what, we're looking for, we're interested in AI. And we just throw all the AI companies we have in our portfolio into the meeting. And there's like a pitch day or speed date, whatever you want to call it. And then it's over. I want to create, the, the whole objective here is to create a rich relationship between ATDC and these enterprises. And really get into a conversation on, okay, your area of focus is, is AI. What are, what are use case scenarios of AI? What are business units you want to apply that in? And really get into a strategic conversation on how that would work, identifying uh, really their corporate culture internally on innovation, uh, decision makers. Uh, so we cover just a lot of those areas. And then together, we'll, we'll curate a list of ATDC companies. So we'll take that 180 in our portfolio and then narrow it down to anywhere it, per session, anywhere from three to five ATDC companies. And really the format is each company gets a 30 minute uh, pitch time. So usually it's a 20 minute pitch, a 10 minute Q and A. And really the idea, more Q and A the better, is to get that moved to a point where conversations can continue after that session. And because uh, my objective is to launch pilots. And I want our companies uh, being able to uh, develop relationships with uh, the large companies, some of them that I mentioned. So some of the pilots that we've launched over the past few years were with 3M, with CMEX, uh, AB InBev, Kings Hawaiian, Macy's, Dow Chemical, and they're all different. They're in, they hit in our different verticals that we focus on here at ATDC. But the idea is getting them as the enterprise that want to come back because we're always changing. We're adding new companies. We have companies that are within our accelerate that pivot their model when they move up to signature. So there's all different types of things happening and we don't have a, a the same number in the same companies every time. So it creates a great opportunity to continue the relationship with these enterprises. And it, for, for folks listening out there who are in corporate roles, um, how do enterprises plug into this to begin with? They, they can reach out. And uh, so we do a few different things. One, I do a lot of corporate outreach on my own, where I, I brought a good book of business to ATDC when I, I got there, but also enterprises that are working with Georgia Tech. Uh, I work a lot with our group within Georgia Tech that bring enterprises through to tour ATDC. So I'll give a tour of ATDC showing the facility. And then while we're doing that, I give a, a brief background on ATDC and the Industry Connect program. And usually about 90% of the time we're able to uh, schedule a deep dive where I'll jump in and what we can do it in person or do it virtually, and uh, and really they can bring decision makers in and other other groups within different business units, and we really get in to the nitty gritty of uh, innovation and, and talk. We we talk everything from use case scenarios to they give a problem they've had. And we talk strategy around that. So it's uh, we're open to work in any way uh, that they they want to. So with that said, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I would love to set up a one-on-one -on -one intro to tell you more about the Industry Connect program and then explore synergies on how to work together. Very neat, very neat. And then from a individual level, um, what are the opportunities? Uh, let's say that there's an individual, uh, whether it's a corporate innovator or a consultant or, or so, somebody with prior startup experience and maybe, maybe they have a little extra time on their hands right now or, or maybe they just want to find a way in this environment especially to be able to give back and to be able to contribute. 
how can those people kind of plug in? Is that through the mentor program or what is the best way for those folks to plug into ATDC? Yeah, so definitely um, through the mentor program, if they're looking to get involved in all of the activities that we got going on at ATDC. And that's whether that's participating in our customer discovery, our financial literacy, our investor readiness um, classes that we have or working directly with companies. So what I'm working on currently right now is to try to better match the mentors with companies that actually have, you know, real hard needs that they need long-term guidance, long-term mentorship. Um, while we have coaches um, on staff, there's no way that one particular coach can meet the capacity and the demand of, you know, 700 maybe odd entrepreneurs that we may touch in a given month. Um, and so and that's where the mentors can come in uh, to play. So if someone wants to engage in that capacity, definitely reach out to me um, and I will make sure that I find ways to try to get them uh, plugged into ATDC and all the things that are going on. But not more importantly, not just everything that's going on in ATDC. We have other um, parts of uh, TechSquare, like we have CreateX, Engage, Venture Lab, all of these other verticals that are part of where we are that have entrepreneurs that also reach out to ATDC um, that are looking for mentors to kind of engage as well too. So I can help facilitate uh, that interaction as well. Very neat, very neat. Excellent, excellent, cool. We have some great questions in the chat uh, following up on the conversation of obviously the kind of the changing times right now with COVID and the impact on businesses. Any stories of ATDC member companies that have changed their business model? that have had to pivot their business model uh, in this time um, and, and what that has looked like? Uh, there are a few, I can mention a few. I don't, Paul, you might talk about your own situation. I don't know if that had uh, much of an impact or not, but there's a company called Purple Cloud in our portfolio that provides uh, back of house services for hotels, which you can imagine is uh, <laughs> in a pretty bad state right now uh, as, a, as an industry. Uh, I think I saw something they were down like 60 something percent in revenues in the last quarter from hotels. But uh, Purple Cloud's offering to help with the back office, uh, they were paying really close attention to their customers and understood that there was gonna be a need for how to come back online under COVID. So how do you clean the rooms? What kind of tasks are needed? How do you build uh, customer trust for the guests that are coming in to make sure that they know that the, the rooms are safe? And so they've created a product around this uh, sort of a restart guide in the services related to cleaning specifically for COVID uh, that has really taken off. And so they've uh, turned a real, a real corner there. Um, it's tough for a lot of companies. Uh, you, there's another company, Avlantio, that's in uh, travel. They were focusing on helping uh, airlines maximize revenue after the ticket sale. You can imagine that's also an industry that's still hurting. Um, but they've understood that uh, the needs of their customers related to more about understanding uh, predicting demand so that they can plan their fleets in this very unpredictable environment. So they were able to take their products and pivot it towards helping to be more precise at demand prediction in this environment. And that's turned out to be pretty popular and picking up steam. So um, it's all about understanding the need of, the, of your customer in, in deep, not just surface level, but really deeply. And one of our uh, things that we teach in the portfolio uh, classes is about how um, you know, our goal is to understand the business better than the customer does, that we understand what their needs are better than they do, that we fall in love with those problems they have rather than the product we're serving. Uh, and we understand the, the, the deep pain that they're in and, and we try to, you know, approach that business that way. And when you can do that, a lot of times you'll find ways that you can serve them in ways that you didn't expect, expect to. So uh, there was a few good, good cases there. I don't know, Paul, if you've got any specific examples of your own case. Yeah, we didn't need to uh, change our business model per se, but what we did do um, is fine tuned things. Uh, to obviously, we don't have the ability to go meet with customers. We typically in our process had working sessions and would you know go out to a, a corporate headquarters, get all stakeholders involved um, prior to uh, onboarding them. And so uh, it's given us the ability to fine tune that process and um, support that fully remotely, which gives us a huge advantage in any environment, but especially now as, you know, uh, the, our, the hybrid environment or uh, the remote work across, you know, our, our company, the ATDC companies and our customers who are all uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 uh, manufacturing supply chain companies. 
Uh, so that's been something that we've really focused on um, and fine-tuned those processes. And we've also made it easier for customers to come on board. Uh, the pandemic changed a lot of um, traditional ways that supply chains were managed. And so there's, a, as I mentioned er earlier, an increased urgency to put technology in place uh, to help support and be more nimble. And so some customers have had their businesses affected greatly, um, whether it's consumer products or aviation, automotive, that uh, you know, we've been flexible to be able to get them started quickly so they can make an impact now and prepare as uh, you know, they can't just look at historical values to plan their supply chain. So high value, low effort, no risk in some cases. Uh, make it easy. We believe in our product enough that uh, making it simple and uh, efficient and quick to onboard and 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 show value and tighten, uh, save money and get better during this time is something that um, has been uh, a big value for us and help helped us grow through this the pandemic. Yeah, those are great points. Yeah, thanks, John and Paul, for sharing. Um, it's really interesting, uh, you know, the, the, as you say, John, one of the things you teach at ATDC is staying really, really close to your customers. And in particular, the period that we're going through right now, there's, there's a lot of changes taking place in customer behaviors, customer preferences, uh, all of that type of thing and what people are thinking about for the future. And savvy companies, like some of the ones you just mentioned, are trying to stay close to what those changing behaviors and preferences are and how they can adapt. And you know, at 352, we're huge advocates of staying really close to your customer. A lot of our business practices, a lot of the consulting and, and work that we do with our clients is based around principles of design thinking and everything's very user-centered and customer-centric in the type of work that we do. Um, and you know, a lot of times you find that in a major shift like what we've undergone, while traditional business models or traditional ways of working are perhaps uh, you know, not as effective or there's not as much revenue there that there are little buds and seeds of opportunity that crop up. And oftentimes it's the companies that adapt and take it and are the first to pluck those buds of opportunities that are the ones that actually can grow through the challenging time and can get on the other side of it and find themselves to be market leaders. So I, I, I appreciate the stories that you, you just shared of, uh, of some of the companies that are doing that. That's really fascinating. Um, so I'm kind of curious then how, you know, with the fact that companies are now remote um, and yet needing to stay closer to their customers than ever before and perhaps needing to also stay closer to their, their mentors and, and their connections with other ATDC companies than ever before in order to keep that knowledge sharing going in this rapidly changing world. How, what are the challenges that companies have to overcome, that, that you know, uh, startups and ATDC companies have to overcome in this kind of remoteness? And is there any advice or, that you could give to them or any company out there listening, whether it's even, even this applies up to the big corporate, the enterprise level, we're now less connected on a day-to-day, -day, at least physically, with our customers. So in this world where we need to stay very much in tune with customer changing behavior, how can we best do that? There's a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we've seen that when the companies uh, already had a pretty cohesive culture and close teams uh, in place when before all this happened, it was fairly easy for them to move remote and uh, continue that operation remote. Uh, I think the verdict's still out on the long-term uh, growth of the company when you bring in new employees that have never been together with the other employees. How do you maintain that culture in this environment? Uh, is I think we're still figuring that out a little bit and that applies to small companies and big companies so for now uh, it's been working pretty well I think companies are um, thriving and, and, and finding out that they can in many cases be more productive than they were before um, but yeah I don't know that the long-term verdict's out on that yet I think there's going to be some some pressure to come back into a more traditional environment after this settles down so that they can maintain and grow those types of uh, cultures um, I think, Paul, you've mentioned you've grown some employees that haven't yet come to the physical office. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, we have. A um, couple, couple early April that we had um, 
extended offers to and, and maintained our commitment uh, to even though the environment was changing and bringing those on and make them part of the team and process has gone really well, uh, better than expected, and has helped us put in process as we continue to do that and, and bring on some more individuals over the next few months. Uh, I think uh, it could be boiled down to like running a lot of little experiments internally of um, things that work, that employees respond to, uh, that helps bring together and foster a culture remotely is important. I think that extends to customers as well. And, um, you know, in our case, corporate customers, you know, Corbett and, and our team have set up uh, regular cadence and communication, even though we haven't seen each other for a few months, um, to see where we can help and um, how we can support one another. And um, our customers have actually um, kind of embraced that experimentation, right? I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things where, hey, let's try, let's try an experiment, let's see if it uh, succeeds or fails um, across the entire business um, as a way to innovate. And I think that's that's sparked this a bit, even though it's a tough time. Um, I've seen more of that uh, across global companies. Uh, we've had a lot of increased global demand, which is, you know, wasn't something that we were necessarily expecting uh, because we are not required or can go see companies in Asia uh, and Europe, we've seen um, demand, uh, whether we were already talking to them or new demand of, hey, we're looking to get better. And um, it's more of an option now for a startup uh, out of Atlanta to support them globally. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I chime in here. I think that I'm very optimistic about where we are. I think that very often do we have a moment in time in history like this to hit the reset button on so many different things. And I think that from a technology standpoint, we, it could have been perfect, like with the tools and the collaboration tools from Zoom to Slack to all the things that we have for engagement. I think that everyone is, is while they might not be okay with how we've been thrusted into this environment, but yet I think that we're adapting and finding ways to be creative. And I think that's at the heart of an entrepreneur and a startup. It's like, okay, let's, let's be creative. Let's make this thing cool. Let's make this thing fun. And I think that through this environment, while I am a contact, let me see you, let me touch you, let me talk to you kind of person, um, and initially onset, it's been a struggle for me to assimilate into this environment, but I've found a way to make this environment fun and make it fun for the entrepreneurs that I touch. And so that they know that, hey, it's just a screen between us, but, but you know, let's treat this as we're physically together. Um, I think from the standpoint of keeping entrepreneurs and companies accountable, uh, we need more touch points more than ever now because the problems are very specific. COVID has unpacked a lot of problems that we did not anticipate or see coming. And I think that you're going to see a whole new wave of different types of companies that will come out of this. And I think as the investment community hits the reset button and the corporations hit the reset button, because we all have problems, that's one consistent thing that will come out of this. Everyone's going to have a whole new set of problems. And now we have a whole new set of creative entrepreneurs that can help solve those problems. And then you put ATDC at the intersection of all of these problems and corporation and investment. We have the ability to facilitate and to help create and to help them pivot, grow, and scale. Uh, and that's what I'm excited about and very optimistic about that. And uh, in this Zoom environment, um, while it's not idea, I think it, it's certainly we will grow and there will be new technologies that will help us um, be more inclusive, more engaging, um, and more collaborative. Yeah, and that's wonderful. And that actually uh, is a great lead in, you know, you're talking about hitting the reset button, you're talking about kind of rethinking things and creating a more inclusive environment. And of course, you know, there's been another major thing happening in our society. And that is that uh, diversity is again on the forefront as, uh, you know, obviously we've seen some horrible instances of police brutality. We have seen, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen, um, uh, you know, here in our city of Atlanta, we've been personally affected by a lot of this. We've had, unfortunately, some of these instances happen within Atlanta recently. Um, and we've seen, uh, obviously, the need 
to really, really push equality and really push diversification. Uh, and that comes through our startup ecosystem as well. And it has been my experience, uh, and this is through uh, mentoring at Atlanta Tech Village, this is through mentoring at Techstars and being involved in ATDC, that our startup ecosystem, from what I have observed, is, is not particularly diverse. Or I should, I should say it at least does not match the demographics of the city of Atlanta. It certainly does not do that. And, you know, John and I were talking prior to this call about how it would be ideal if the startup ecosystem could match the demographics of the city. And by the way, this is not just a challenge with Atlanta. In many ways, Atlanta has a much more progressive and diverse startup ecosystem than what you find in other parts of the country. This is a challenge across the nation. Uh, but it's, it is a challenge here in Atlanta that we have the community uh, and the leaders throughout the community to potentially solve. So I'm curious uh, to hear what, ATD, what ATDC's perspective is on this and how we could potentially all work together to make the startup, startup ecosystem more diverse and inclusive going forward. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, to, currently today, ATDC's portfolio have, the, the, has indicated about 34% um, or so, a little over a third of our portfolio companies have indicated a minority uh, member on the founding team. I think that's probably more diverse than most people expect, but certainly doesn't still match the demographics in Atlanta. And what that tells us is that we're still missing talent. Um, when you're trying to do entrepreneurship, it's, it's tough. You're trying to create something new in the world. And in order to do that, you need to look at the problem that you're trying to solve from as a wider aperture as you can get. And so for an, an entrepreneur in the startup community, uh, having diversity around the table is like a superpower. It's not just the right thing to do, it's a competitive advantage. And um, I think Atlanta is as well positioned as any city in the country to get this right, um, to understand that and to leverage that talent that exists here so that we can create the next wave of um, Fortune 100 companies. I mean, ultimately, I think our goal is to create the next Googles and Apples and, and Deltas and uh, UPSs from black founders right here in Atlanta, Georgia, um, who, would just, who, who are in the network, but making sure that we're providing all the services that we can to make that happen. So our goal at ATDC is to make the circles of companies, the, the rooms where these founders are doing their work, to be as diverse as they can possibly be, because that diversity of approach is what gives that startup an advantage to breach the best ideas possible to solve those problems. And like I said, I feel like we're well positioned in Atlanta to make that happen. The talent is here, the network is here. There's lots of new uh, funding opportunities um, for uh, black founders in particular uh, to, uh, to get resources. So um, it's, it's an exciting time. I don't think this is a moment that will pass. I think this is something that's gonna be transformative for the city, for the country. And uh, I'm excited to be part of what we think of as um, a significant part of the solution to leverage that talent that exists here and get rid of any of the artificial impediments or um, you know, things that are in the way from bringing that talent to bear. So that's, that's my perspective on it. Yeah, I would yeah. like to add to that. And I would like to you know, say that you know, working at ATDC has been a joy for me. And, and partly because having a leader such as John, who, and I'm gonna use the word talent, the operative word there, who has given me the total freedom and the autonomy to be me in this environment, um, to be creative and to, to develop and introduce new ideas and, and the willingness for him to listen and say, okay, run with that, make it sense. Don't cost me any money, but make it happen. Uh, so and he's definitely <laughs> been a, a, a good leader uh, in that regard. Uh, and so, you know, and with that, it allowed, me and the staff to think about what are some of the creative ways that we can do to better our position in the ecosystem by servicing minorities. When you think of, you know, most of our coach, I would say a third of our coaches look like me from Berkeley to Monique, you know, to all the staff that we have that are committed to bringing that diversity and that inclusion to ATDC, but letting also founders in the ecosystem know that uh, we're here to support um, them as well. 
and not that it's a, a us versus them, but it's a us together. And I think that as this ecosystem, Atlanta also has a unique opportunity. I think the rest of the country is watching us to see how do we handle this diversity issue and how, more importantly, how do we handle it in the tech space? Because we have a lot of heavy hitters in this ecosystem from the Joel Burks to the Joey Womax to the folks that have an interest in developing this ecosystem, the Ryan Wilsons, all of these folks that are committed to making sure that this ecosystem thrives. Um, and if I have anything to do with it, I'm going to make sure that Silicon Valley and all these other ecosystems are second to AT2 to Atlanta because we have everything here. That we have the investment, we have the talent, we have the resources, everything that we have here. Um, and there's a couple of programs that, that I'm working on behind the scenes um, that will be launched at a later date that will help with that, that execution and scale component um, and better positioning companies for a funding aspect. But, but I'm committed, this ecosystem is committed and you know, you know this, this thing is, is that Atlanta will have something to say, ATDC will have something to say, and as long as I'm part of ATDC, I'm gonna make sure that there is inclusion and I'm gonna make sure that every minority black founder that comes through that door, that they're welcome, that they feel comfortable, and they're given every ounce of resource that they need to thrive and to survive, and we're definitely going to shift the narrative, and John has been very gracious in that, his heart is committed to that. Georgia Tech is committed to that. Our president has said he wants to make sure that, you know, the Georgia Tech is a number one entrepreneurship ecosystem for startups. I mean, from care, all of us are committed from all the staff meetings and all of our faculty there is committed to making sure that we create the best ecosystem and environment possible. And I'm just happy to be a part of that. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Wonderful to hear. Yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll uh, add just something, you know, as a founder and um, you know, not a diverse founder, but something that drew me not being a native Atlantan to build a company here is the culture and the diversity based in Atlanta that you see in the metro Atlanta area, the companies that um, call Atlanta home, uh, the brilliant, diverse, young talent. Um, that's being fostered at Georgia Tech is a cert certainly a huge advantage and um, something that we're really focused on as a really young company um, to, to start building, you know, um, our you know, diversity into our culture as we grow. And it's something we talk about uh, all over the country when we're in Silicon Valley, the Northeast, the Midwest of uh, all the great things Atlanta has going on, um, not just from business, but uh, the people here and um, the culture that is a huge advantage for us. And you know, one of the reasons we call Atlanta home. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. I love, yeah. I, I love Atlanta taking a leadership role. Uh, Nikki, as you said, you know, nationally being the being the model that Silicon Valley and others look to, I mean, absolutely, we should be that. And I think that it's wonderful to hear the proactive steps that you're taking and that ATDC is taking. And I, and I know these similar sentiments are, are uh, shared throughout the startup ecosystem. I know uh, Atlanta Tech Village uh, has done a wonderful job of building out programs uh, to specifically help minority founders uh, and and uh, help put them through accelerators and various programs to help them uh, learn and get their businesses established. And so I think it's wonderful that the entire community can come together and rally behind this. And, and I think that, you know, this feels, this time at least, this feels not just like a fleeting moment, like perhaps it has been in the past, uh, but more of a true movement uh, that will continue and continue to have momentum behind it. And I feel that momentum building. Uh, and so that's that's very exciting to hear, and I, I'm excited to certainly be part of that ecosystem, supporting that as well. Absolutely. Very good, very good. Well, we're down to our last couple of minutes here. Uh, we're going to get everyone out of here uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time because I'm sure everyone's got busy de busy days to get to. Uh, so we got we've got our last couple of minutes. Let's wrap up. I would love to hear kind of any parting thoughts and just recommendations for the audience in terms of. You know, you've got we've got an audience now who's probably excited and engaged to to get involved, whether whether uh, potentially uh, getting involved as a member company or potentially getting involved as a mentor, as or as a corporate or enterprise. 
what would be your recommendations to them on just you know how you take that first step and and uh, any any uh, parting thoughts or suggestions to them? From a, a entrepreneurial perspective, I can say we have our educate program twenty five dollars a quarter, uh, less than ten bucks a month. Basically, I would just encourage any entrepreneur in the state of Georgia who's looking to start a company to sign up for that. Our classes are virtual and online, and uh, you can learn a lot about what it takes to, to build a business and see if it might be something you might want to do officially to move forward. So that's easy to do, atdc.org, uh, and we go from there. And the key, I guess, on the mentor program? Yeah, our, um, our entrepreneurs need your help. They need your support. They need your guidance. This is an unusual time for them. It's hard enough to build a startup then to compile it with the social issues, the, the COVID-19, they need your help, they need your guidance, I need your help, I need your guidance, um, and the mentors too. If you want to serve as a mentor, please reach out to me. I would love to have you. Wonderful. And, and Corbett, I know you kind of talked about the corporate side a bit already. Yeah, <clears throat> I would love to meet anybody that's uh, interested in learning more about the Industry Connect program. You can reach out to me on email or even LinkedIn, and then we can uh, schedule an intro call and get into it and then see how we can work and do an Industry Connect session. And Paul, any suggestion to fellow founders out there or folks who are thinking pot potentially about taking this period to start a company, how should they get started? They should reach out to uh, John and team at ATBC, come, come and uh, learn a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I think a big part of I was a corporate employee for over a decade and then moved into uh, an entrepreneur role. And um, I think while it's a difficult time, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, big businesses built. Um, so do it is a, is a big piece of advice and, um, and be curious and, and want to learn and absorb um, all of the great information and uh, opportunities that are present in Atlanta. And then for, uh, for anyone that wants to get in touch with us, uh, verison.com, uh, at Verison AI, um, pretty much most of all of the channels. And um, for any uh, diverse engineers, data scientists, uh, we have several open roles now and coming uh, open. Please reach out to us and, um, and, and the corporates out there. Uh, we'd love to be able to help support your growth through this time. So. All right, Paul. Paul, are you on TikTok? You said all the channels now. Are you on TikTok? <laughs> that is one that I'm going to refrain from right now. If you're nobody, not on TikTok, then you're not on all the channels, Paul. Right. It doesn't count. I need to see that 15 second video of you of you of you doing some dance there. I need to go on and see that tonight. <laughs> are you sure you want to see that? <laughs> I, I do. I definitely do. I feel like it would be very good for your business. <laughs> awesome, yeah, we'll John. <laughs> John, Paul, Nakia, Corbett, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it. And certainly best of luck uh, with everything uh, at ATDC. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate 352 and everything you guys do as well. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.